There are three things that your air conditioner should be doing. It should be cooling your air, it should be dehumidifying air, and it should be giving you the best quality of indoor air possible. What is the best strategy to accomplish all three things? Let's find out today on Smith House. Make sure you go check out mtcopeland.com where we have the best instructors teaching the coolest classes that are taking the trades to the next level. Our classes will follow the craftsmen through the arc of their career from apprentice who knows nothing about the trades through journeyman all the way through mastery of the subject. So what is the best strategy to make sure that your air conditioning system is cooling your air, dehumidifying your air, and giving you fresh air on the inside. I'm only looking at the hot humid south here. There's other strategies for other climate zones, but anywhere that it's hot and humid, this is what I'm looking at. Let's talk a little bit about how air conditioners work first. It takes the heat from inside your home and it transfers it outside the home. You have a refrigerant that's compressed outside. That compressing makes the refrigerant hot, so you cool it with these big radiators and fans and then that refrigerant goes inside and it's expanded and now the refrigerant gets very cold and that cold refrigerant is ran through coils and then air is brought across those coils and the heat from inside the air goes and transfers to the refrigerant. The refrigerant goes back outside and the cycle is continued. Also, as that air crosses those coils, any gaseous water that is in the air as humidity will condensate, or some of it will condensate onto those coils, and that condensate will drip out as liquid water and you are dehumidifying your air as well. Traditionally, we have a single stage compressor. The air conditioner is on, the fan, the compressor, and the interior fan all turn on all at the same time and at one level. And it looks a little bit something like this. As the temperature rises throughout the day, it crosses a threshold that you set on your thermostat, say 72 degrees. When it crosses that, the air conditioner kicks on 100%, turns on. It cools the air of the house down below the set point and it shuts off. And this repeats as much as necessary. Now sizing becomes a very critical component to all of this because if you make the air conditioner too big, you do something called short cycling. It's turning on, cooling the air very quickly, and shutting back off, off on, off on, off on. And that's really hard on the equipment, and it's very energy inefficient, and it doesn't do much for efficiency. Think of an air conditioner as a big flywheel. Once it's up and running, it's pretty easy to keep it up and running, but that starting takes so much energy. Same thing with an air conditioner. You don't wanna be starting and stopping it, it just takes a whole lot of energy. And because you're not moving very much volume across your cold coils in that short amount of time, you're really not dehumidifying as well. And it's not great on the equipment to always be cycling on and off like that. So on the other extreme is you have an undersized unit. Undersized unit's not good either because it's just not able to keep up with the heat loads. Everything's getting hot and you have it set at 72 and now it's 76 and you're like, this isn't right. And so you call your HVAC repair guy to say what is going on. And it's just undersized. So you wanna be sized correctly right in the middle. There's a couple of problems with that. Number one is most HVAC companies don't do full ASHRAE calculations. They just know that we've done this many houses in this region and we usually throw in this type of unit. But if you're not building the same type of house that everybody else is building in the area, you're probably gonna be oversized and you're probably gonna be short cycling. Even if you find somebody who does the calculations, it's really difficult because when you do the calculations, you're making all kinds of assumptions based on bedrooms and sizes and windows and all of that. Well, if you've got the calculations perfect for that house, the occupants can also move it up and down. If it's a family of six in a very busy household that loves to cook, you're gonna have much higher heat gains in inside the house than if it's a retired couple that doesn't cook much and just keeps all the shades down and, and really energy efficient. It's gonna be completely different demands on that system. So it's very difficult to size it correctly. Adding to the complexity is the easy answer is just oversize it slightly. But if you oversize it slightly, you're making the humidity worse because 
even oversizing it slightly, the best dehumidification is for the AC to run all the time because you're always moving that air across the coils and pulling the pulling the humidity out. If you oversize it slightly or even correctly size it, it's just not going to be running enough to pull the humidity out. So now people are uncomfortable. They don't know why their their thermostat says 70 and it's set at 72, so we're good temperature wise, but it just feels, I don't know, feels clammy. So what do they do? They crank it down to 66, turn on the air conditioner, and it dehumidifies the air and they start feeling better, but now they're cold, so they put on sweaters. Very inefficient way of doing it. The next stage is a two-stage compressor. Now this gives you a little bit more flexibility because instead of it just kicking on at 100%, it kicks on at a set lower point and then if it can't keep up, it goes to the big full guns approach. So the temperature comes up, it goes over your set point, it goes on to its low setting and it's able to cool the house back down. But then if the day heats up and it starts heating up again, it kicks on low, it can't keep up with the temperature, the heat load, and so it kicks on to the full amount and it's able to bring it back down. And this is better because you've got a couple of different stages being able to switch between high and low. The drawback is it's more complex and it is a higher cost unit than the single stage and it really doesn't do anything on your humidity problem. It doesn't. They may say they do. They may say also dehumidifies, but you're always at a fixed dilemma between temperature and humidity. For an air conditioner to dehumidify, it's got to cool. And if it's going to have to cool below your set point, it's not going to want to do that. It says, you set it at 72, the humidity is rising, but the only way that I can get rid of humidity is to cool the house down and you don't want me to cool the house down. So I just, I'm going to let the humidity rise. The next solution is a VRF. Now this is a variable refrigerant flow and this can start anywhere between 10 and 20% from zero to say 20% as our start point. And then it can vary itself in very small increments down to like 1% increments between 20 and 100%. Some of them will go even lower than 20% on its low. What this means is that you don't have that big flywheel to get started all the time. The flywheel is always turning and it speeds up as load increases and it slows down as load decreases. So we're able to control our outdoor unit variably, our compressor variably, and our fan speed all variably. And it gives us a lot more control. In fact, it gives us the best control of humidity in moderate humidity climates, right? Places where you need a dehumidifier some of the time, but not really all of the time. It's really good at pulling that humidity out because you can cool the coils, slow the fan speed, and pull that moisture out of the air. However, you are still cooling the space. Even slightly, you're still cooling the space and you're, you're just intrinsically at war with yourself between cooling and dehumidifying. So what is the solution? The solution for all three of these is to make sure that you put in a dehumidifier if you're in the hot, humid south. A dehumidifier is only looking at humidity. It pulls that humidity out the same way. It's pulling air across cold coils, but it's actually putting a little bit of heat into the structure of the home, which is okay in most cases. They do have some mini split systems that you can look at. I like it to have a little bit of heat gain. Doesn't bother me at all because now my air conditioner is cooling and all it's doing is cooling. So my controls for my air conditioner get much more simple. It's not trying to make decisions for me. Controls for my dehumidifier are really simple. All it's looking at, at is humidity. And so off a single controller, I'm able to set my temperature and I'm able to set my humidity and all is right with the world. Which brings us to, do you need a VRF system if you're already installing a whole home dehumidifier. In my humble opinion, right now with the technologies and costs at what they are, I don't think so. I think the VRFs are great. If you have the means, definitely get them. They are better by every measure. No question. Um, except for they're a lot more expensive. Let's say that if a single stage costs one, a dual stage may cost two, and a VRF may cost four somewhere in that range. And those will depend on what equipment you're doing, who's your technician is, what area you live in, all of that. But it's, it's somewhere around that range. And when you put a pencil to it, you just can't justify the ROI. If all you're concerned about is your return on investment, you, I don't think you can justify spending the higher dollar for the VRF if you do a very well designed whole home system. So your home is built tight, it's well insulated, you don't have unintended um, drafts 
through there, it's just a very well-built house. You have a ventilation system that's bringing fresh air in through a dehumidifier. It's all dehumidified and filtered when it comes into the space. And then the air conditioner is able to kick on and off as needed. I have built several houses this way. I have lived in a house for several years that was built exactly like this and it was fine. I didn't notice any fluctuations in the temperature. You know, oh, it's too hot. No, it's too cold. And no, it was very, very consistent. Not as consistent as a VRF, but more consistent than what I could tell. I never thought, oh, it's too cold. Oh, it's too hot. I could not tell those minute swings in the temperature because I'm more sensitive to humidity and my dehumidifier was keeping me locked on right at 50%, just day in, day out, 50%, and I felt great. I was able to run the thermostat up higher, like 76, maybe 78 instead of 72, and I was still comfortable, which meant my utility bills were very low. All electric house, electric um, induction range, electric water heaters, uh, tankless water heater, all electric, and if I did that again, I'd do a hybrid today, but at the time it was an electric tankless. 80 bucks a month, family of six, 80 bucks a month electric. That was all of my utilities for that whole house of about 2250 square feet. Very efficient. I could not have paid myself back if I went to the VRF system in that. Now, again, if you have the means, I love VRF, definitely knock yourself out, but don't feel bad if you're like, man, I really don't have that kind of money. Get a good, high efficiency, single stage, and I would skip the two stage. I just think it adds more cost, more complexity, and really doesn't give you that much. Do a great job on your building, get a single stage with a dehumidifier, and you're gonna be very happy. Comment below if you agree. Comment below, because I'm sure some of you are just itching to disagree. Comment below if you disagree what's been your experience. Go check out mtcopeland.com. Follow them at Instagram, mt.copeland. Follow me, Jordan Smith Builds, Smith House Co. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe if we've earned it. And we'll see you next time on Smith House.